one of the foremost scholars of the Holy Quran that we have in the world today. He is none other than Brother Gary Miller, who is affectionately called Brother Gary. He is a citizen of Canada and resides in Toronto, and he now goes by the name of Abdul Ahad Omar. He was once a missionary for the Christian Church, and it was biblical research connected with his church activities that led him to discover the vast difference between the official dogma of the church and the contents of the Bible. He was under the impression that the Quran too would contain a mixture of truth and falsehoods. However, within a few days of reading the Quran, he realized that the message of the Quran was precisely the same as the essence of the truth that he had distilled from the Bible. Truly, Allah works in mysterious ways. For from that moment onwards, Brother Gary Miller was for all intents and purpose a Muslim. This transformation occurred in 1978. Since then, Brother Gary Miller has delivered a series of lectures in many parts of the world. He also presents Islam in the form of debates and questions and answer sessions. And he has appeared on television and radio programs as well. He has just completed a successful lecture tour in Tokyo, Japan. Besides these strenuous activities, Brother Gary Miller also writes about Islam and has to his credit several articles and publications about Islam. By profession, by profession Brother Gary Miller is a mathematician. The title for this evening's talk is The Amazing Quran. At the end of the lecture, you, that is the audience, will be given the privilege to ask as many questions as you like on the subject. Brother Gary Miller deserves a careful hearing and now Without further ado, I request Brother Gary Miller to address you. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. The title advertised was the Amazing Quran. I would suggest, first of all, that to call the Quran amazing is something that isn't done simply by Muslims who may have an appreciation for the Quran and they're very uh, pleased with it but the book has been called amazing by non-Muslims non-Muslims in fact people who are very filled with uh, dislike for Islam have still been surprised at the Quran they've been amazed at what it has to say so that is some of what I wanted to talk about one thing that surprises the non-Muslim those who are examining the book very carefully, is that the Quran does not appear to be what they would expect. What they know is they have an old book. It comes from 14 centuries ago in the Arabian desert. So they expect that the book should look something like that. It should look like an old book from the desert. And then they find out that it doesn't resemble what they expect. One of the first things that some people notice is that if you have a book that's old and it comes from the desert, it should talk about the desert. And the Quran does. Some of its imagery concerns the desert, but it also talks about the sea, what it's like to be in a storm on the sea. In fact, some years ago, the story came to us in Toronto of a man who was in the merchant marine so he made his living on the ocean and somebody gave him a copy of the Quran to read a Muslim gave him a translation to read he knew nothing about the history of Islam but he was interested when he finished reading the book he brought it back to the Muslim who gave it to him and he said uh, this Muhammad was he a sailor because he was impressed at how it described so perfectly a storm on the sea. When he was told, no, as a matter of fact, he lived in the desert, this was enough for the man. He embraced Islam on the spot. He was so impressed because he'd been in a storm. He knew that who wrote this has been in a storm on the ocean because of the description of waves within waves and the darkness between them, the precise description. It's not what somebody imagines a storm is like on the ocean, it's what somebody knows a storm is like on the ocean. So this is one indication of the kind of thing I'm getting at. 
that the book doesn't seem to be tied to a certain time and place from the desert 14 centuries ago. The scientific uh, ideas expressed also don't seem to originate from 14 centuries ago. Many centuries before that, there was a theory well known of atomism, which was advanced by the Greeks. Uh, Democritus, in particular, was the man's name, who lived about 23 centuries ago. Democritus and the people who came after him assumed that matter comes in a smallest piece, the atom. The Arabs used to deal in that same concept. And the word in uh, Arabic, zarra, an atom, commonly meant that. It's the smallest piece of matter. Now, modern science finds out that, yes, there is an atom, there's a smallest unit of matter which still has the same characteristics as the element, but that atom comes apart, too. That was a, a new idea. That's a development of this last century. Interestingly enough, that doesn't outdate the Quran, because we have an interesting statement which is usually missed in any translation of the Quran in an ayah that mentions the tiniest pieces of things and it mentions this varra saying an atom or anything smaller than an atom now 14 centuries ago that sentence would look unusual even to an Arab because to him a varra well, that was the bottom that's the smallest things get the Quran mentions that, in fact, Allah is aware of everything down to the zarra and anything smaller. So the book is not outdated. Another example of what we might expect to find in an old book is what you will find in virtually any old book that comes near to the subject of health or medicine. Various historical sources tell us that the prophet of Islam was very concerned with health and hygiene, very concerned with cleanliness. That was his reputation. So you would think that if you have a book which originates in his head, it should talk about medicine. That if you have this disease, you should try this. If this makes you ill, try some of this. Because history reports he had a lot of opinions on the subject. He had a lot of ideas about if this is your disease, this might be your cure. He had a lot of opinions that way, but none of them are in the Koran. There's no home remedies in the Koran that could be outdated. In fact, the Koran only mentions one item, which is not in dispute by anybody. It mentions honey, saying that in honey there's a healing something there is that's good in honey. I don't think anyone will argue with that. But it does not contain any of a man's opinions about what is beneficial, what's the best food to eat, or what is healthiest for you, what will cure this or that disease. Another item that you... Can we turn this down just a little bit? <laughs> Another item that you might also expect to find, if you assume this book is the product of a man's mind, is it should reflect some of what is going on in his mind. In fact, if you look up in certain encyclopedias, various books, the subject of Islam, many books will tell you that the Quran was a product of the hallucinations that this man had stuck for a while. Well, if that's true, if it originated in some psychological problems going on in his mind, it should look like that. But does it? What kinds of things do you suppose went on in his mind and his heart? He had a very difficult life. He had three sons who died as infants. All of his daughters except one died before him. He had a wife of several years who must have been quite a woman because in fact when the first revelation came to him he ran home to his wife afraid I suggest to you that even today 
you'll have a hard time finding an Arab who will tell you, I was so afraid I ran home to my wife. Won't be likely to say that. But that's how influential and strong a woman she apparently was. She died. Does the Quran mention any of these things? The death of his children, his wife? Never. Never discusses these things. And yet they must have been the things that hurt him and tortured him, caused him pain and grief through his whole life. They never show up in this book which is supposed to originate in his tortured mind. So I've just given so far some examples of how the Quran contains what you don't expect it to contain, and it's missing what you might expect should be there. A really scientific approach to the Quran is possible because the Quran offers something that is not offered by religious um, scriptures, generally speaking. Religions don't offer this. It's what the science scientist demands. Let me explain to you what I mean. You see, today there are any number of people who have ideas about how the universe works. They have theories. You could find them all over the place. But the scientific community doesn't even bother to listen to them. Why? Because within the last century, the scientific community has demanded one thing. They say, if you have a theory, don't bother me with it unless you bring with that theory a way to prove that you are wrong, a test of falsification. Otherwise, don't bother me. That's why the scientific community listened to Einstein toward the beginning of this century, because he came with a new theory. He says, I think the universe works like this, and here are three ways to prove that I'm wrong. So the scientific community listened. They subjected it to the test. Within six years, he'd passed the tests which he offered. It doesn't prove he's right, but it proves he deserves to be listened to. Because he said, this is my idea, and in fact, try this. You want to prove I'm wrong? Here, do this. That's what the Quran has, falsification tests. Some that are old, some that exist till today. Because it makes statements saying, if this book is not what it claims to be, then all you have to do is this or this or this to prove that it's false. It offers falsification. I'd suggest to you, maybe the next time you get into some kind of a dispute with a, somebody about uh, Islam and he's claiming he has the truth and you are in the darkness, that might be the first thing that you suggest to tell him, is there something in your religion which, if I could show it to you, would prove you're wrong? Is there anything? Because I can promise you, people won't have anything. They don't carry around that idea that I should not only present what I believe, but I should offer a man a chance to prove me wrong. But Islam does that. The Quran says, this is the truth, and to prove that it isn't, try this, or this, or this. As examples of that, you have what was to me the most surprising uh, verse that I read in the Quran when I first read through it in the fourth surah, the 82nd ayah, where it says, have they not carefully considered the Quran? If it came from other than Allah, surely they would find in it many inconsistencies. Now that is a challenge to the unbeliever, saying to the unbeliever, you say this book is not a revelation then of course you will show me a mistake in the book, won't you? It surprised me because that's not really even human nature to write like that. We don't take an exam in school and when we finish the exam we write a note to the teacher saying this exam is perfect, there are no mistakes in it. Find one if you can. We don't do that. The teacher won't sleep until he finds a mistake. And yet, that's the way the Quran comes. It says, this is true. In fact, if you don't think it's true, then all you have to do is show an inconsistency where it says this, but it says that, and it contradicts itself. It should contain many of those things, shouldn't it? So find one. But more about that uh, later on. That's one example of this kind of thing of offering 
a falsification test. Maybe more interesting to you today is that there's another attitude that comes out in the Quran over and over, and that is advice to the reader. It tells the reader about different facts, and then it gives the advice saying, if you want to know more about this, or if you doubt what is said here, then ask the man who knows. Ask the men of ilm. The, the literal expression in Arabic means today the scientist. It says, if you don't believe it, ask the man whose specialty this is. Ask the man who knows these things. He will tell you this is true. That too is a surprising attitude to have a book that comes from somebody without training in these things, but when he talks about geography or botany, biology, uh, whatever his subject, he mentions something and then says, if you doubt it, go ask the man. Ask the man who knows this thing. He'll tell you this is true. In every age, there have been Muslims who have followed that advice and made some surprising discoveries. If you look to the Muslim scientists of so many centuries ago, you'll find that their works are full of quotations from the Quran. They will tell you that they did the research in such and such a place, they looked for something, and they tell you, the reason I looked there for this thing is because the Quran says such and so. It told me this is a good place to look. It pointed me in this direction, and I found this. The Quran says, for example, about the origin of man. It mentions in one place, about where man comes from, and then it says to the reader, research it. Gives you a bare hint of the origin of man, and then it says to you, you should find out more about this. You should research it, and it gives you a hint where to look. That's the kind of thing that Muslims today, largely, it seems, overlook, but not always. A few years ago, a group of brothers in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, collected all of the verses in the Quran that talk about the growth of the human being in the womb, embryology. And they took the advice of the Quran, ask the man who knows. So they wanted to find out, is what the Quran says? What is the truth? And so they asked the man who knows. They chose, as it happened, a man who is professor of embryology at the University of Toronto in my city, not a Muslim. His name is Keith Moore. He's the author of textbooks on embryology. He knows. He's a world expert in embryology. So they invited him to Riyadh. They said, this is what the Quran says about your subject. Is it true? What can you tell us? They gave him all the help that he needed in translation, all the cooperation that he asked for, and he was so surprised at what he found that he changed his textbooks. You'll find, in fact, as I say, one of his textbooks is called Before We Are Born, as of the second edition of that textbook. In the history of embryology, he includes some material that wasn't in the first one because of what he found out the Quran says, that it was ahead of its time. People knew what other people didn't know if they believed the Quran all those centuries ago. I had the pleasure just about a week ago of interviewing him for a television presentation. We talked a great deal about this. It was illustrated by slides and so on. He mentioned that, in fact, some of the things that the Quran said about the growth of the human being weren't known until 30 years ago. In fact, one item, he said, was new to him. But he checked on it. It was true. So he added it to his book. That, in particular, had to do with the description of the embryo. What is its appearance? When he read the description in the Quran, he thought about it. He said it's when it describes the human being that at one stage it resembles alaka, a leech-like clot. He said, I'd never thought of that before, but he went to the zoology department and asked for a picture of a leech, and it looks like the embryo. So he put both pictures in one of his textbooks. He has another one uh, on uh, clinical embryology. When he presented this information last fall in Toronto, it caused quite a lot of stir across Canada. It was reported in the newspapers. It was on the front page of many newspapers across Canada with some 
funny headlines, but people have, don't clearly understand what it's all about, I guess. One headline said, uh, uh, was it surprising things found in ancient prayer book, something like this. Um, but one newspaper reporter asked the professor, they said, don't you think maybe the Arabs might have known about these things? The description of the embryo, its appearance, and how it changes and grows. Maybe because uh, they weren't scientists, but maybe they did some crude dissections. They carved up people and examined these things. So the professor had to point out to them that the man had missed a very important point in all the discussion. All the slides that he projected for us, all the pictures he showed us of the embryo were taken through a microscope. He said it doesn't matter if somebody used to try to discover embryology 14 centuries ago, they couldn't see it. Because all of this appearance of the embryo described in the Koran is when the item is still too small to see with your eye. You need a microscope to see it. Now the microscope has only been around for a little more than 200 years. So he also suggested, he said, if you believe that maybe 14 centuries ago somebody had a microscope and he did this research and they, got, they made no mistakes and then they somehow talked this man into putting it in his book saying, this is true, trust me, put it in your book. Then they destroyed their equipment, kept it a secret that they ever had a microscope. He says, if you believe that, be my guest. He said, but you really shouldn't say that unless you bring some proof because it's so ridiculous. In fact, when he was asked, how do you explain this information in the Quran? How did it get there? His explanation was, it can only be revealed. Now, that's a non-Muslim, but a man who knows. That's all he has to say. One of his colleagues, his name is Marshall Johnson at the University of Toronto, is in a related field to embryology. But he became so interested in how what the Quran said guided the Professor Moore to some interesting ideas that he asked the Muslims to collect for him everything they could on another subject. <laughs> he wanted to see if it would lead them to anything as a hobby. His hobby is geology. So we asked, would you collect everything the Quran says about geology, that is the, the structure of the earth? He wanted to see where it might take him. Because some people have been very surprised in that regard. In fact, there's a man from Yemen, Sheikh Zindani is his name, who has a very effective way of delivering uh, Islam to people. He doesn't tell them that's what he's trying to do, but he collects things like this. He went to a man, a British man, who was a professor, a professor of geophysics, that is, uh, the construction of the earth. The man was also an atheist, as it happens, and had written some on atheism. But he asked him, he said, if the earth opened up and swallowed me, what would I see? And this professor said, that's a good question. And he gave him quite an explanation. He said, inside the earth you would find such and such and so. And when he had finished his description, the sheikh passed to him translation of the Quran and said, would you read that verse? Because there's an ayah where it talks about some of those who opposed uh, Musa. It says, uh, if the earth was opened and swallowed them, they would see such and such and so. And here was the description the man had just given. He was so surprised that he accepted Islam on the spot. Uh, this, in fact, is on a, a tape recording of a, a talk that uh, Sheikh Zindani made. He had the tape recorder running in the man's office to <laughs> bear witness. Huh? Here's the man, here's what he said. In any case, don't be misled of what I'm getting at here. I'm not trying to prove to you that the Quran is a revelation by telling you these things. What I'm talking about here is an attitude that's in the Quran that you won't find anywhere else. Because the Quran does a very interesting thing. When it gives information like this, it often tells the reader, you didn't know this before. Now, there is no scripture that anybody has that I know of that says things like that. There are ancient writings and scriptures that many people have, and they give a lot of information, but they tell you where the information came from. You have the ancient history of the Bible, for example. 
And when it tells you this king lived here and this one fought in this battle and he had so many sons, then it tells you if you want more information, read the book of so-and-so because that's where this came from. It tells you where the information came from. But the Quran says, in many cases, here is information which you didn't have before, but check on it. You'll see that it's true. It's interesting that that was never challenged by the non-Muslims 14 centuries ago. The Meccans hated the Muslims. And time and again, they would hear this kind of thing. They'd hear some piece of information, and then part of the revelation says, you didn't know this before now. Now, the Meccans never spoke up and said, that's not true. I know where he got that. We learned it in school when we were children. It really was new. And the Muslims followed the advice given here. It said, if you doubt it, check. Check if you don't doubt it. So it was that when Omar was the caliph, he chose a group of men and said, go find the wall of Zulkarnain. The Arabs had never heard of it before, but the Quran tells you what it looks like and where you find it. So Omar said, you, 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 go find it and report back. It should be in such and such a place. When you get there, it should look like this, and so on. So they went off to find it. It's in uh, what is now called Durband in the Soviet Union. Now again, my point here is that the Quran may be accurate about a lot of things, but accuracy does not mean that a book is a revelation. What it means is you have a problem. It means you should find some explanation for where did this information come from. But an accurate book is not necessarily a divine book. The telephone book is probably accurate. It doesn't mean it's a revelation. But the point is to work the other direction. If you find a mistake, then you disqualify something. And that's what the Quran encourages. There was a man who came to me after a, a lecture in South Africa last year, and he was very angry about some of the things I had to say. He said, I'm going home tonight, and I'm going to find a mistake in the Quran. I said, congratulations, that's the most intelligent thing you've said. That's what you want to tell somebody to do, because the book offers the same challenges. Do you think this is not what it says it is? Then try this, try this. It's supposed to make you look. It's not a book that is delivered as though you are commanded to believe it, now read it. It's supposed to work the other way. You read it and you come to believe it because you can't disqualify it. It earns your respect because you cannot find a disqualification. Now again, I have to stress, just because you can't explain something doesn't mean that you can take the first explanation somebody offers. You see, uh, you may have some religious groups who will tell you, well, look, we had a miracle last night. A man came to us, he couldn't walk, and we said some words, and he got up and he walked. How do you explain that? And if you say, I can't, they say, ah, you see, I have the true religion. It's the power of God. Maybe, maybe not. Just because you can't explain it doesn't mean you have to accept his explanation. The same goes for the Quran. If you find something remarkable and surprising in there, just because you can't explain it doesn't mean that you have to believe it's a revelation. That's your business. But it shows the difficulty that people have if they say, I don't believe it. The Quran points out that these people have an obligation to find an explanation then. In fact, it mentions one man in an ayah, which I have always seen mistranslated into English at least. It talks about a man who heard the truth explained to him, and then it says why he was guilty. It says he got up and left, and he didn't check on what he heard. It says you're guilty. If you hear something, but you don't check to make sure it's true, you're guilty. That's a crime. You're supposed to process the information to decide which is the garbage to throw out, which is the good to keep. But you can't just let it come in and rattle around in your head. You're supposed to put it into the proper category. Is it true? Is it false? Is it still uh, speculation? Maybe true, maybe false, but I don't know. Put it in these categories. The real certainty, that is the confidence that comes in the Quran, comes from a a different approach. The certainty in acceptance of the Quran comes from exhausting the alternatives. To explain it this way, 
the book says it is a revelation. If you don't believe that, what is it? You have to come up with some explanation. You have a book. It's paper and ink. Where did it come from? It says it's a revelation. If it isn't, then where did it come from? You have to have some explanation. And the interesting thing is, no one has come up with an explanation that works. And in fact, the alternatives have been exhausted because they basically reduce to this. And it's been well established by non-Muslims. They'll tell you, well, the book, if it wasn't revelation, either that man deceived everyone or somebody deceived him. Either he fooled people or somebody fooled him, one or the other. That's what the non-Muslim says. And they do an interesting thing. They fall into two schools, insisting on one or the other. You have a large group of people who have researched it for hundreds of years, and they'll tell you one thing we know for sure, that man, Muhammad, he thought he was a prophet. He was crazy. Except for Allah. But they're convinced that he was fooled somehow. Another group will tell you, because of this evidence, one thing we know for sure, that man was a liar. He fooled everyone. These two groups never seem to get together. <laughs> In fact, if you look up many references on Islam, usually a reference will tell you both. They may start by telling you the man was crazy and they finish by telling you he was a liar. They never seem to realize you can't be both. If you are deluded, if you think you are a prophet, then you don't sit up late at night trying to figure out how will I fool people tomorrow so they'll think I'm a prophet. In fact, a, a great deal of the Quran came in answer to questions. Somebody would ask the man a question and the revelation would come with the answer. You see, if you are deluded, you think that an angel puts words in your ear, then when somebody asks you a question, you think the angel will give you the answer. You're crazy. You think that. You don't tell somebody, wait till tomorrow, I'll have the answer. And then you run to your friends that night and say, does anyone know the answer? This is a man who doesn't believe he's a prophet. You can't have it both ways. You could be deluded, or you could be a forger. You could be neither one. You can't be both. You can't mix them. But I say, what you have is one group of people who will tell you they assemble a lot of evidence and they say because the Quran is not a revelation we have to explain these things and they have a list of things they must explain and they say the only explanation for these things is the man was deluded he thought he was a prophet and another group of people say because the Quran is not a revelation we must explain these things and they have a different list of things and they say the only explanation for these facts is the man was a forger, he was a liar. He knew what he was doing, but he lied. These two groups don't get together to realize that you have to explain both lists of difficulties. You need this excuse here, and you need that excuse in this place, but you can't have both. To give you an example, the kind of circle that people go in, you ask somebody, What's the origin of the Quran? They tell you it came from the imagination of a man. But then you ask him, if it came from his head, where did he get his information? That is, the Quran talks about a lot of things which the Arabs didn't know about. If it came out of his head, how did that information get in his head? Then they'll tell you, well, maybe he wasn't crazy. Maybe he was a liar. Some foreigner brought him the information, so he lied. He told people he was a prophet. But then you have to ask them, if he was a liar, where did he get his confidence? Why did he behave as though he thought he was a prophet? And then they have to tell you, well, maybe he was crazy. He thought he was a prophet. And they start over and go round and round in this circle. As uh, I've illustrated the one point, you have the information, like the wall of Bill Carnine. Who told this man about this place hundreds of miles to the north? Who told this man about embryology? and so on. When people assemble these facts, they have to assume that, well, 
somebody brought him the information and he used it to fool people. But now, if you assume that he was a liar, where did he get his confidence? Why is it that, for example, he told some people to their face what they would not say? That involves being convinced that you have a revelation. The Prophet had an uncle by the name of Abu Lahab, or that was his nickname, Abu Lahab. Here was a man who hated Islam, who used to follow the man around, he used to follow the Prophet around. If he saw him speaking to a stranger, he'd wait till they parted, and he'd go to the stranger and say, what did he tell you? Did he say black? It's white. That's how he thought. It was the opposite of what that man said. But about ten years before this man died, before Abu Lahab died, the little surah, which is called Lahab, is in the Quran, and it says of this man, in just these few words it describes him, it says, in effect, he'll never change. He'll never be any different. For about ten years, the Muslims could go to Abu Lahab and say, it has been revealed to us that you will never be a Muslim. All he had to do was say, well, I want to be a Muslim. How do you like that? What do you think of your revelation now? But he didn't do that. And yet that's the kind of behavior you would expect from the man. He always said the opposite of what the Muslims said. See how dangerous that is from a human point of view. You're saying to somebody, you hate me? You want to finish me? Here, say these words and I'm through. Come on, say them, say them. But he wouldn't do it. In order to put something like that in your book, you have to be convinced that you really have a revelation. When the prophet fled from Mecca to Medina and he hid in the cave with Abu Bakr, they could see people coming to kill them. Abu Bakr was afraid. Now, if this man is a, a forger, somebody who lies to fool people he's a prophet, what would you expect him to say when he sees people coming to kill him? You would expect, he might say to his friend Abu Bakr, see if you can find a back way out of the cave. Or <laughs> squeeze over in the corner and keep quiet. But in fact, what he said to Abu Bakr on that occasion was to relax. He told him, don't worry. Because Allah is with us. He was confident. If you know that you're fooling people, where do you get this kind of attitude to say, no, it's going to be fine. So, as I say, you can go round and round in a circle, and people do. Because on the one hand, they may tell you Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the man was a liar, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, uh, they'll tell you that uh, he was crazy. And you, you can't have it both ways, but they need both excuses to explain certain things. I had a minister in my home, that'd be about seven years ago, and uh, we were talking, and the Koran was sitting on the floor with the... Uh, title facing down, so he didn't know which book it was. And uh, I mentioned, I just pointed to the book, I said, I have confidence in this book. Well, he looked, but he didn't know which book it was. He said, well, I'll tell you, if that's not the Bible, it was written by a man. So I said, let me tell you something about what's in that book. And in just three or four minutes, I told him a few things, nothing that I've mentioned here, it's something else, about what is in the Koran. And after three or four minutes, he said, you're right. He said, the man didn't write that book. The devil wrote it. <laughs> so, which is unfortunate <laughs> to have that attitude for many reasons. Uh, for one thing, that's a, a very quick and cheap excuse. There's a famous story that, uh, a report that uh, is in the Bible. It talks about how some of the Jews were witnesses one day when Jesus raised a man from the dead. A man who'd been dead for four days, he said, get up, and the man came out of his tomb. And it says, some of the Jews who stood there and watched, what did they do? Did they say, it's a miracle. The man was dead, now he's alive. This is a true prophet. Some of the Jews said, no, no, it's the devil that did that, that raised him up. Now, this story is rehearsed very often in churches, and people cry big tears over that. They say, oh, if I'd been there, I wouldn't be so stupid as the Jew who would say that. I mean, a miracle, a dead man gets up. How could I say it was the devil? But they start to resemble those kinds of people 
If in three minutes you show them enough that all they can say is, oh, the devil did it. It's too much. Maybe the devil did, but that's a very quick decision to make. It's what the Meccans used to say, some of them. They said the devil brought in that. But just as with every other suggestion made, the Quran gives an answer. It says in one verse in particular, it says, Do they say this came from Satan? Remind them of this. And it gives an argument in reply to that. There are many arguments in reply to that suggestion. For one thing, the Quran tells us that it says when you read this book, you're supposed to be in the habit before you read this book to say, A'udhu billahi mina shaitani rajim, which means I take refuge in Allah from Satan, the rejected. Is this how Satan writes a book? He tells you, before you read my book, ask God to save you from me. That's, that's very, very tricky. A man could write something like that, but can Satan do that? Can Satan put that in his book? Would God allow Satan to do that? Some people really show where they have a split mind on this. They'll tell you, yes. On the other hand, these are the same people who will tell you that the devil is uh, hes just that much less than God. But whatever God can do, probably the devil can do it too. Well, that's, that's the attitude of somebody who says, this book is so surprising, no matter how good it is, the devil could do it. Muslims don't have that attitude. Satan may have his abilities, but they're a long way separated from the abilities of Allah. It's a, as I say, it's a cheap and, and, and quick excuse. It should also bring us back to think about that verse I mentioned before. Even the devil should contradict himself when he writes. And the Quran says, if it didn't come from Allah, you should find some contradictions in this book. There's another uh, attack sometimes made, or another direction that people come from. They may tell you that, well, your prophet was a liar and he was deceived. That is, he fooled himself. Uh, there's a name for that in psychology. They call it mythomania. It means you tell lies and then you believe them. You say, that's what he was. You see, he told lies, but then he believed his own lies. The problem with that idea is that mythomania cannot deal with facts. See, the Quran talks about facts, things you can go and look and see that they're true. The mythomaniac can't do that. Facts are a problem for him. The psychologist, the psychiatrist, tries to treat a man by confronting him with facts. If a man is mentally ill and he says, uh, I'm the king of England. The psychologist doesn't say to him, you are crazy, you're not the king of England. He doesn't say that. He confronts him with facts. He says, you say you're the king of England? Tell me, where is the queen today? Who is your prime minister? Bring me the army. Or something like that. So the man has trouble trying to deal with this. He has to make excuses of uh, the queen. Um, uh, she's visiting her mother. Uh, the, my prime minister, uh, uh, he resigned. Uh, you know, he has to make excuses because the facts give him trouble. And this is how he's cured. If you keep putting enough facts in front of him, finally he faces the reality and realizes, I've been deluded. That's the way the Quran approaches everyone who reads it. There's an ayah which says, in these words there is a healing. Now this is part of the meaning of that. It's therapy. It heals crazy people by telling them, you think this, you think that? Well, don't forget this. Have you considered such and such? That's the repeated kind of attitude throughout the Quran. It's saying, oh man, do you say so and so, but what about such and such? Oh man, have you said so and so, but didn't you also say this? How can you try that when you know this? It's always putting the facts in front of you, pushing your nose into what is relevant, what matters. So it heals you of your delusions. That's at least one aspect of the meaning of that verse. Maybe that has not always been as appreciated as it should be. There are till now some people who will tell you that the meaning of this verse is that there's 
medicine in the words of the Quran. Maybe. I know of a man who was quite ill, and so somebody took a page from the Quran and they poured water on it and they washed all the words off and they put the ink in a glass and they said, you drink this, it will heal you. Well, maybe. That would be one understanding of those words. I personally don't think so, but maybe. But certainly, people are healed of their craziness by the words of the Quran. It has this type of thing, confronting people with the facts, has come to the attention of a lot of non-Muslims. In fact, you'll find an interesting reference in the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, here is the Catholic Church that has been around for so many centuries. The Quran is a problem for them. It says it's a revelation. So they study it. They would love to find proof that it isn't. They would love to find an explanation for what is it really, but they can't. At least the Catholic Church has been honest in its scholarship. They don't take the first quick excuse. In the New Catholic Encyclopedia, in the article on the subject of Quran, the Church says that over the centuries, many theories have been offered as to the origin of the Quran. And in their own words, they say, today, no sensible man accepts any of these theories. This leaves the Christian in some difficulty. See, listen carefully to what they're saying. They're saying if the, for somebody who says the Quran came from here, it came from there, they have this idea, this theory. The church says in 14 centuries, we still haven't heard a sensible idea. There is no sensible man that believes any of these suggestions as to the origin of the Quran. That's why they say it leaves the Christian in some difficulty, leaves him in a lot of difficulty. He'd like to explain it, but he hasn't been able to yet. So that's maybe a, a second point I'd suggest, that when you meet someone who says, oh, the Quran it came from here or there, they say, I can explain it. I have an idea where it came from. Tell him, go talk to the Catholic Church. They'd love to hear from you. They're waiting for an explanation. If you've got it, they might buy it from you. Because at least they've been honest enough to admit that in 14 centuries, they haven't found one yet. So it is not an easy thing to dismiss. Other groups of people have been a lot less honest than that. They'll quickly tell you, oh, the Quran it came from here, it came from there, without examining that to see does that is that thing at all possible, or can you explode it, push that away? In fact, most recently, the leading intellectual in the Catholic Church, Hans Kung is his name, he's been around for a lot of years, and he's highly respected in the church, sort of the, the intellect of the church today. Recently, after studying the Koran, he gave his opinion. He said, God has spoken to man through the man Muhammad. Now, that's his conclusion as the leading intellect in the Catholic Church. I don't think the Pope agrees with him. But this is what the leading intellect of the Church says. Because he's facing the reality that it is not easily pushed aside. That in fact, God said these words. So as I say, if somebody has a, a better idea, they should go and talk to the, the church about it. Or they should find a new possibility. But I think that we have exhausted the possibilities. If the book is not a revelation, then it is a deception. And if it is a deception, what is its origin? And where does it deceive us? I'll come back to that in a moment. But I'd also like to point out that it may seem I'm discussing some things that uh, there are surprising things you find in the Quran taken from ancient times, but there are surprising things found that have to do with our modern times. That is, the Quran is not an old problem, it's still a problem today. You have the interesting statement, for example, that it is the unbelievers who would take note of the fact that in the beginning the heavens and the earth were one piece, that all life is made of water. Well, that's what they awarded the 1973 Nobel Prize for. A couple of unbelievers have talked about the origin of the universe, how it began from one piece, which they keep verifying till now. That life is made of water is probably 
wouldn't have been a very easy thing to convince people of 14 centuries ago if you stood in the desert and told somebody, you see this? This is made of water, mostly. It's, it's water. That had to wait for the invention of the microscope to find out that cytoplasm, the basic substance of the cells, is 80% water. I mentioned falsification tests, chances to prove the Quran is incorrect. Some of those stand there just like the challenge to Abu Lahab. Some of them stand there today. In fact, you have an interesting ayah which says, speaking of the relationship not between individual people, but between groups of people. It's saying, as a group, in effect, it says the Christians will treat you nicer than the Jews treat you. It tells the Muslims that, as a group. Now, I say there have been a lot of Christians and a lot of Jews who have become Muslims, but as groups of people, this will generally be the case according to the Quran. Do you realize what that is? That's a chance for the Jews to prove that the Quran is false. All they have to do is get organized and treat the Muslims nicely for a few years. And then say, what does your book say about uh, who is your best friend in the world? But I mean, really, who treats you the nicest? The Jews or the Christians? Look what we Jews did for you. That's all they have to do. They haven't done it yet. But it stands there as a challenge saying, you want to prove it's wrong? Do this. And as I mentioned, if somebody wants to insist that the Quran is a deception, then they have to show where the deception is. That is, it's a common theme that runs throughout the Quran time and time again. But the Quran says, do they say such and such? Let them bring their proof. You are never supposed to say something unless you bring the evidence. Do they say the Quran is a deception? Let them bring their proof. Show me one deception. Where does it deceive me? Show me a lie that it has told if you say it's a deception. Otherwise, don't say that unless you show me. It's not good enough to tell me. Show me. Now, I know that some people, they have some ideas about where the Quran has deceived the Muslim. But this just shows they haven't examined it very carefully. Maybe the Muslim hasn't examined it very carefully. In fact, you will find as an example, uh, some Christians will say, well, where the Quran deceives you is, it tells you about all sorts of good things that you should do, but it lies to you. It tells you God doesn't have a son. Is that a lie that the Quran has told us? Well, as a matter of fact, the Quran does not forbid the Muslim to believe that God has a son. It doesn't say, the reason God doesn't have a son is because it's forbidden. It doesn't say that. It tells you why he doesn't have a son. It gives you the reason. Because God doesn't have a son because. If when you say son you mean this, that can't be. Do you mean this when you say son? That can't be. Do you mean that? It exhausts all of the meanings of son to say each one of these can't be true of God for these reasons. So it doesn't forbid you from believing it. It tells you why. It doesn't lie to you. There's even an interesting verse that says the Muslim is supposed to repeat if God has a son, I will be the first to worship him. So it's not telling you he doesn't. It's saying, if he does, you should worship him. But in fact, he doesn't because of these reasons. So again, the deception is not an easy thing to find. I stress that to people. If they want to say the book deceives, let them show the lie they're talking about, which is the false thing it says. And don't be misled onto this kind of thing. I had that talk in uh, Minnesota, in the U.S., a few months ago, and a man got very upset with a lot of things I had said, and so he started writing to me when I got home, and he said he had a whole book full of mistakes in the Koran, and uh, he wasn't going to show me any of those because he said, you showed me mistakes in what I believe, but it doesn't change my belief. I still believe. He says, and you'd be the same way. If I showed you a mistake in, in what your book says, you'd still believe it. So I wrote him back to say, no, that's the difference between us. If you show me, show me a mistake, I won't believe anymore. Because that's my attitude. I don't believe in spite of the difficulties. So I told him, I said, you pick the best mistake you can find. Tell me about it. What is the best mistake you can find? And what he wrote me was that the Quran says that Zachariah couldn't speak for three days and the Bible says he couldn't speak for nine months. 
says, there's your mistake. Well, it's not so much a mistake as it is a matter of his book says this and my book says that. Uh, what remains to be proven is whose book is correct, which in fact can be demonstrated. But you see what I mean? It's not disagreement that is a problem. It's the actual proof. Somebody has to bring you the actual mistake, the case that will stand up in court to say this is false, but it's in your book. There's another way that a person can approach the, the Quran in examining the things that it has to say. I'll just illustrate this uh, briefly. You can discover how surprising the book is by assembling what you might call a list of good guesses. See, the Quran talks about a lot of things. But if I can explain it to you the way it works in, in mathematics, when you make guesses, if you have two choices, one is right, one is wrong, and you close your eyes and make a choice, half the time you'll be right. So you have a one in two chance. You could pick the wrong one, you could pick the right one. So one time out of two, you'll be right. But if you have two situations like that, I can be right or wrong about this, and I can be right or wrong about that, and I close my eyes and I guess like this, I'll only be right one time in four. It becomes one half times one half. That's because there's three ways to be wrong now. You see, I can be wrong and wrong, or I can be wrong and right, or right and wrong. But the only way to be right is to be right and right. That's one out of the four possibilities. If you have three situations like that, and you make a blind guess three times, I've guessed this, and I've guessed that, and I've guessed this, you'll only be right one time in eight. So you're half times a half times a half. Suppose that your options are one in ten, and you have another situation where there's ten guesses, only one is right, and ten guesses here, only one is right. If you close your eyes and pick one, you're only going to be right one time in a hundred one-tenth times one-tenth because you've got 99 ways to be wrong and only one way to be right. So it is that if you draw up a list of the correct things the Quran has said, it becomes a very uh, unlikely that these are all good guesses. If it has millions of ways to be wrong but it's always right, then it's unlikely that somebody was guessing. I'll give you three examples that already make the odds one in eight. The Quran says about bees. It speaks of the bee which leaves its home for gathering food. And it says in this ayah that this bee is female. Now a person might guess on that and say, well, the bees that you see flying around, they could be male, they could be female, I think I'll guess female. He has a one in two chance of being right. So happens the Quran is right. It also so happens that's not what most people believed at that time. Can you tell the difference between a male bee and a female bee? It takes a specialist to do that anyway. But the male bee never leaves the home to gather food. In fact, in Shakespeare, in his play Henry IV, some of the characters are talking about bees, and they mention that the bees are soldiers and they have a king. That's what people thought in Shakespeare's day. They thought the bees you see flying, these are men, bees. And they go home and they answer to the king. Well, that's not true. Those are female. They go home, they have a queen. <laughs> but it took modern uh, investigation in the last 300 years to realize that that's the case. The Quran is right. But it had a 50-50 chance of being right. But here's another situation where it could have guessed incorrectly. The Quran talks about the sun and how it travels through space. Now, if the sun is moving through space, there's at least two options. It could be traveling just as a stone would travel if you threw it or it could be traveling with its own motion. The Quran says it has its own motion, it uses a form of the word sabaha, which if you use that word and you talk about a man, if you say he uh, did this, uh, yasba, 
along the ground, you don't mean that somebody rolled him, you mean he's walking. If you say that of a man in water, you don't mean that he's floating, you mean he's swimming. If you say that of the sun, you don't mean that it's just flying through space, you mean it's turning as it goes through space. Well, the Quran says the sun turns. Is that an easy thing to discover? Can you tell the sun is turning? If you look at it, you can look for a, a second or two and you have to look away. You don't see any marks on it. You don't see anything after a few seconds. But in modern times, the equipment was made available to project the image of the sun down onto a tabletop so that you could look at it without being blinded. And then you see that after all, there are spots on the sun and they move. And the sun turns once every 25 days. So it is turning, but that's a modern discovery. A lucky guess, but the odds are one in four about getting both of these guesses about the bees and the sun correct. And another indication would be to think back 14 centuries ago, people probably didn't understand about time zones that back at home right now, my family's having breakfast, oh, but it's dark here and the sun just came up there. See, 14 centuries ago, a man could only travel about 35 miles a day. And if he traveled from India to Morocco, it took him months. And probably when he had supper in Morocco, he thought, back at home, they're having supper now in India. Because he didn't realize he has moved across the time zones. But the Quran is aware of that. It tells you in an interesting ayah, it says that when history finishes, when the judgment day arrives, it will happen in an instant. History ends in an instant. But it mentions that in that instant, it will catch some people in the daytime and some people in the nighttime. So which Muslim scientists have been aware for 14 centuries. If they believe that, they said, well, at some time on the earth, it's day and night at the same time. That's not a thing that's obvious to your eyes or to your experience, but the Quran mentions that. So again, it's a good guess. And you can draw up a long list of good guesses, and the odds become very high that these are all guesses. To do this kind of thing is following in the best tradition of the Muslims, to investigate that way. The Quran expects this kind of challenge. You see, if I said, to somebody, I pick out somebody here, I said, you, I know your father, I met your father. Probably he's in doubt. You just came here. <laughs> how do you know my father? For all I know, he has no, his father is dead, for all I know. Is he, he's saying, how could you have met my father? Tell me, is he a tall man, short, bald, does he have a beard, does he wear glasses? Where did you meet him? But if I keep giving him all the right answers, finally he may say, I guess you know my father. I don't know how, but I guess you know him. The Quran is in the same situation. It says that it originates with the one who originated everything. So you have a right to say, convince me. If the author of this book really originated life, originated the heavens and the earth, he should know about this, he should know about that. Tell me something that proves you were there when life came to be. Do you know this? Do you know that? And that's what people have examined in every generation for 14 centuries. We all know something for sure. We don't have to be an expert on uh, something in an academic field. I mentioned to you when I started, the sailor. What he knows is his experience. He knows what a storm is like on the ocean. Everybody knows something. They have a right to say, I wonder, does the author of the Quran know that thing? Uh, for myself, uh, because of my field uh, in mathematics and logic, there's a very delicate point which caused quite a bit of excitement only a hundred years ago among mathematicians. It occurred to me the author of the Quran should know about that. It would take too much explaining to go into it, but I checked and he did. It's there in the Quran. But it's a, a development of the last hundred years in logic. We all know something and it should be there. The answer should be there. We should be ready to give an account to justify ourselves. That's the meaning of Iman. Iman is not properly translated faith, which usually means uh, in English, faith means a promise to believe something even though it seems it must be impossible. You believe it without evidence, that's faith. Iman is not that. The root meaning of that word means confirmation, emunah, means when you check on something. You believe it because you looked, 
and you saw indications that it was true. Doesn't mean necessarily you prove every item, but you look and you see this agrees with what I know so far. You've thought about it, so your iman grows, and you're supposed to do that all your life. I'm afraid that Muslims very often don't have the confidence to deal with these things. And yet you have the ayah in the 25th surah, the 33rd uh, ayah, where it says there is no question that they bring you, but we give you the best answer and the explanation of it. So whatever question they have, the answer is in the Quran. I have mentioned in, in seven years of giving lectures in various places that I have basically only heard 35 questions. Now, I've heard hundreds of people ask questions, but I've heard about 35 different questions. That's all. The Quran says, no matter which question they bring you, we give you an answer. People have a long ways to go. It's an interesting thing you'll find if you look in the index of the Quran. This is a, an index of every word in the Quran, al Wajim al-Mufahris. It's what you should expect to find, according to this ayah. It says, for every question they bring you, we give you an answer. Allah says the answer is here. If you look up the word in the index, kalu, it means they say. You'll find it's in the Quran 332 times. 332 times the Quran says, they say such and such. And if you look up the word kul, which is the command say, you'll find it's in the Quran 332 times. Now for everything they say, you tell them this. 332 is a long ways from 35. There's a lot of questions people haven't even bothered to ask. Quran has the answers. And it's not that big of a book, about 80,000 words, which is supposed to offer you the reply to what somebody says. By way of advice, I suggest, if you're going to take up this kind of activity to arm yourself with the knowledge of the Quran and the answers it gives, there's a number of things to keep in mind. Be very careful that you are considering the original wording of the Quran. I don't know of any translation in any language that doesn't contain some mistakes in the translation. Or if not mistakes, uh, it does not make the point clearly enough as in the Arabic. Now that's not to say every Muslim has to learn Arabic, but that is to say that the real answer to a lot of problems is contained in the Arabic. You will find a lot of examples of this kind of thing which even when Muslims translate. That's one of the things that surprised me about the Quran, was how consistent the author is in his choice of words. If he tells a story one way, he doesn't trip himself up in another place by telling it in, different, in a different way. Don't be fooled by this kind of thing. We have in Toronto uh, a group of uh, people whose mission in life is to convert Muslims away from uh, Islam. And the Muslims always go to the lectures that they put on. <laughs> they find it very entertaining, in fact. And recently, uh, a man gave a talk, and he was explaining how, he said, you know, if you Muslims paid more attention to the Quran, you might be Christians. Because look what the Quran says here about Jesus. It says he is ayat lil alameen, a sign to all the worlds. Do you see that? It doesn't say that about your prophet. But it says of Jesus, he's ayat lil alameen. Think about that. You might be a Christian. So a friend of mine asked when the question period came, he said, I want to sort out the confusion. You said that because I read that Jesus was ayat lil alameen, I should be a Christian. What should I be when I read in the Quran in this place where it says Pharaoh, Pharaoh, was ayat lil alameen? Which religion will that lead me to? Because it says the same thing about Pharaoh. The exact same words describe Pharaoh as describe Jesus in this case. They're very different kinds of people, of course, but they have this in common. But if you're not aware of that, a person can be fooled in this way. The man who said this probably knew that, but hoped that the Muslims didn't. Or maybe he didn't know. It doesn't matter. He'll keep using it. I know this man, and that's his reputation. You see, by way of a second piece of advice, both the Muslim and the non-Muslim, if you're going to investigate something, 
Take the advice that the, the scientific community gives now. They tell you, they tell a young man who's starting out to investigate, uh, he's newly out of university maybe, or in university, and he wants to make a career being a scientist in some field, and the advice they offer him is, get hold of a theory and defend it, even if it's false. Defend it if you can. Because if it's false, eventually you won't be able to defend it. But at least it's been thoroughly tested, and you've made progress. You know this one is false. You see, you have to investigate Islam in the same way. Investigate it as though you were a Muslim, and somebody's challenging you. Can you answer what he says? See, the mistake so many people make is, they tell you they investigate Islam, but they didn't want uh, Islam in any sense, so their attitude is, the first thing they can find that makes Islam look bad, ah, there's what I needed, this is my excuse. And they reject Islam. But to really make progress, you have to deal with it as though you were on the inside. It was the attitude I took, because believe me, there are all kinds of books that criticize Islam. But it occurred to me, well, what do Muslims say about these things? If there's all these criticisms, why is anybody a Muslim? Maybe the Muslims have answers to these things. And in fact, they do. Some of the answers have been around for 14 centuries. It doesn't matter. People keep using the same excuses. In fact, it was only a few months ago somebody handed in a question to me on a paper after a talk. They said, what about this mistake in the Koran, where it says that um, the mother of Jesus was uh, the sister of Aaron? So that's a confusion. Miriam has been confused with Miriam. Miriam was the sister of Harun. Miriam lived hundreds of years later and was the mother of Jesus. So your book has a mistake in it. See, for 14 centuries, the Muslims have explained, no, this word here translated uh, in this way does not necessarily mean a sister. It means a woman from that family. It means she was descended from the family of Aaron. It's a figure of speech. You say sister of Aaron, you mean from the family of Aaron not necessarily literally errant. No, 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 some missionary groups will tell you, it's a mistake. Well, if they want to call it a mistake, be my guest. Do you know that the Bible says, on the subject of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, the mother of Yahya, it says she was the daughter of Aaron. You tell them that and say, no, 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 you see, daughter doesn't mean daughter, it means great, 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 great granddaughter. That's an example of, you see, taking the first thing that looks like it will work instead of finding out, does it really work? I'll tell you one last story along those lines, which has gone out over a period of <laughs> about three years now. About three years ago, the man who was the head of this missionary group in Toronto said, uh, at a public meeting, he said, there's a serious mistake in the Koran. In the place where it says, the Jews boasted, we killed the Messiah. He said, the Jews would never say that. A Jew would never say, I killed the Messiah. They're waiting for the Messiah. They wouldn't say, we killed the Messiah. Your book is wrong. So it was pointed out to him that this was sarcasm, that the Quran also says that the Meccans used to come to the Muslims and say to them, you to whom the revelation came, tell us something. It didn't mean the Meccans believed that the revelation came to these people. They were teasing them. The Bible says that the Jews said to Jesus when they crucified him, they said, save yourself, Messiah. They didn't say false Messiah. They said, Messiah, save yourself. Come down from there. So they teased him. They were sarcastic when they said Messiah. And that's all the Quran talks about. It didn't matter to this man. Two years later, one of his students came to a talk that I gave, came to me after, he said, you know, there's a serious mistake in the Quran, and he brings up the same argument. I said, two years ago, I told your teacher this, and I gave him the reply. He put out his hand, he wants to shake my hand, he said, okay, I'll give you that. He said, that's, that's a silly argument. But I asked him, then why does your teacher still use it two years later? Because he doesn't care if it works or not, he hopes it will fool somebody. Some people 
think that way. They use as justification a scripture passage which says, if I tell a lie but it glorifies God, I'm not a sinner. Some people believe that. That's what they think that verse means and that justifies lying for the sake of the truth. You can imagine such a thing. Some people. Other people don't. As I said, I've had some fine people come to me, representatives of church groups who've asked me for names and addresses of people who say this because they're angry. They say, I'll stop him if I can because they care about truth. Finally, only a couple of months ago, this same man had a, a meeting and in the question period, I brought up this same point. So this argument you've been using for three years at least, it's false for these reasons and I want everyone to know that. And it embarrassed him very much, but he said, uh, well, I, I still don't think a Jew would ever say that. So at this point, somebody put their hand up. And he was anxious to get away from this discussion, so he quickly said, yes, yes. The man spoke up and he said, last week in this room, there was a rabbi giving a lecture on religion. And when the question period came, I asked him, what do Jews say about the Messiah? And he laughed and said, well, we Jews killed the Messiah. So there you are. It's on tape. There are eyewitnesses here. Once there was a rabbi, he said those words, we Jews killed the Messiah. I don't think it will matter to the man. Three years from now, he'll probably still use the argument. It doesn't work. So by way of advice and suggestion, you may hear a lot of difficulties that people try to bring up, but examine it and remind them they should examine it. The task of the Muslim is not to win people away from their religions. The Muslim doesn't go around saying, you shouldn't be that, you should be this. You should leave that and uh, come to Islam. That's not really the Muslim's job. The Muslim says, you, whichever religion or belief you have, should be more careful. Don't commit excess. Don't say more than you have the right to say. Because the Muslim believes that if a person will do this, if he'll make sure of what he says, eventually he'll come to his land. But that's the starting point. So I thank you for your time and attention and patience. Uh, may Allah guide us always closer to the truth. Alhamdulillah. I'll take questions. I guess the arrangements are made to take some questions if you want to step up here. We have come to the end of the lecture and now we come to the second important part of this lecture which is questions. Anybody here? Yes. Brother, actually I have no questions to put. My many questions have been amply satisfied long time ago. But if you allow me, I have a comment to make. Generally, Muslims call their holy book the Holy Quran. The fact that you choose the amazing Quran for your lecture of this evening was an astonishment to me when I received the kind invitation of the Islamic Information Center. But when I listened to you, I understood amply why you used this amazing terminology to describe the Holy Quran. My comment is this. The Holy Book of Islam has got its own characteristic that makes it distinct from previous Holy Books in which we also believe. This characteristic consists in the fact that the holy book is not only the faith of Muslims but also the proof of the authenticity and the truthfulness of this holy book being the revelation of Allah and this proof 
consists in its term in two main factors. The first is its miraculous power of expressing meanings in Arabic language, the linguistic power of Quran. And this in history and in the time of revelation was the main proof, the main miracle, the main challenge that Muhammad used against non-believers to try to imitate the linguistic power of expression. But in modern ages, this linguistic power has been much reduced because of the simple fact that Islam has been embraced by non-Arabs. Even nowadays Arabs do not really master their own languages as they did 14 centuries ago, except for specialists. That's why time has come for the second main proof of authenticity of the Holy Quran, the scientific authenticity of the Holy Quran. Preachers until now have been putting the accent on the linguistic power and conviction of the Holy Book. But in modern ages, this age we call scientific age, age of science, time has come to put the stress on the facts, scientific facts that have been revealed 14 centuries ago and were not known not only by Messenger Muhammad والسلام, but also by the whole humanity. The human knowledge were, falls, fall, fell very short of the facts included in the Holy Quran. Nowadays some of these facts have been known to us and this is a promise given in the Holy Quran itself. Allah said in his holy book that we will show them our ayat, our proofs in all the horizons, meaning horizons of science, until they know that this is the true revelation by God. So I wanted Mr. Missionary Abdul Ahad Omar to place you in your right place. You represent the Muslim missionaries who preach Islam to modern ages, who reveals the wonders, the proofs of the holy book from this point of view of science, of quiet discussion between minds and arguments. That's why I wish to make this comment to congratulate you and to ask you to go along with your endeavor for which we are indebted to uh, uh, would uh, just remind me of a, a couple of things to mention. Uh, uh, the Quran is also often called uh, by the uh, description of Majid, and Majid is not that far from what you might say is amazing. I mean, it is glorious. It is surprising, uh, and it, uh, the revelation too is spoken of. Uh, in one ayah, it says to the Prophet, "When it is revealed to you, it says Ajibta." Because you marvel, you're amazed. They ridicule, but you're amazed. Uh, so the thought is there. Uh, and also, stress what you may yet find too is that the linguistics is itself today a science. So the surprising aspects of the linguistics are still a scientific thing to point out to people. Because the Arabic language today is a problem for people because it hasn't changed in all these centuries. It's borrowed a lot of words from some place, but the Arabic is still uh, preserved, uh, due largely, I suppose, to the Quran. But that in itself is a problem for the linguist. No other language does that. It uh, evolves in time. So that the, the linguistics was the second thing that I noticed in the Quran that surprised me so much. Because I read a translation, probably one of the worst translations there is, of the Quran. But then in having discussions with Muslims, they'd be talking about this or that, and they'd say, well, you know, the Quran says such and such. 
And I'd be so frustrated. I think, I read the translation. I don't remember that. So they'd show me in the Arabic. And you'd realize that the translation missed this point and that point. So I realized right away, in order to get the full meaning, you've at least got to examine the original. And so much is missing, uh, uh, very often in translations. And some really remarkable things. They are virtually... Uh, well, it'll take me too far off the, the track, but that's what led to a lot of interesting developments. You had questions there? Uh, uh, it's uh, asking for some elaboration on where this ball of Rul Karnain is. Uh, is it true that the Yajuj are the Russians? Um, uh, a, not specifically, unless you loosely mean by Russians anybody who lives north of a certain point. Uh, then it may well be this is Yajuj and Majuj but uh, Durban is in the Soviet Union but not in the Russian part of the Soviet Union it's in the south part and uh, in fact there are two cities called Durban but where you find the, the so called wall of Alexander is the description given in the Quran now it's called Alexander's wall because it used to be believed that Alexander the Great built it that's now been disproved Alexander didn't have anything to do with that wall a lot of Muslims will tell you the Volkar name is Alexander the Great. It seems very doubtful, but maybe, but <laughs> it seems doubtful. In any case, history will not now support that Alexander built Alexander's wall, but it is the description, according to the Quran, Durbent. Uh, probably you could find in some encyclopedia under Alexander or Durbent more information about that. What is the best English translation of the Quran? Um, well, what I usually tell people to do is get as many as you can. Because if you don't know the Arabic, at least when you read, compare how the translations are of the same verse. And if each author translates the verse just about the same, then the chance is you're getting most of the meaning out of it. But if they have different translations for the same verse, then there must be a difficulty then you should inquire from someone who knows what is the problem. Why do they have trouble with this Arabic? So if you have a lot of translations to compare, you can make some progress this way. Uh, the nicest reading one in English now is probably by Arbery. It's called The Quran Interpreted by Arthur J. Arbery. Uh, there's one done by uh, Thomas Irving, which is just now coming into print. He spent 25 years translating the Quran into English. He spent one year on one word. He wanted to be so careful. Um, so I would recommend that. I've seen the, the manuscript of it. Um, and there's various others around. Uh, but as I say, your best bet is to get as many as you can and compare. Uh, did you learn Arabic before reading the Quran and so on? Well, that's what I was just explaining. Uh, I read a terrible English translation. One of the worst ones made is one by Dawood or Dawood, where he takes all of the ayat and shuffles them up in different orders and that. And there's a lot of very deliberate mistranslations in that uh, book. So uh, I studied enough Arabic so that if you give me a dictionary, I can figure out what's going on. Uh, in Sri Lanka, the majority do not know the Arabic language to learn directly from the Quran. Uh, can you learn from the English translations? Well, that's basically what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> is that you can learn a lot from anything, but just remember what's going on, that you are reading a translation. Do you know, I'll give you an example of the kind of mistakes you'll find. Uh, I found even in uh, translations by uh, Muslims, you'll find an ayah in the, in the translation that tells you, no one can change the words of Allah. And the same translation will tell you, people change the words of Allah. Now that sounds like a contradiction. It's a contradiction because of the translator's mistake. If you look in the Arabic, you find out that this is one of these pieces of precision in the Quran. That whenever the Quran talks about words being changed, it talks about kal, the kaul. When it talks about no one changes the words of Allah, it talks about the kalimat. So the translators, even Muslims, have been careless enough to think kaul equals kalimat. Puts it that way. But no, in Arabic there's a difference between kaul and kalimat. In the 
Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, mentioning that uh, the brother had talked about uh, Muslims believe in other uh, uh, holy books. Uh, how holy do you think they are in the present form? Do Muslims believe in their authority? Uh, this is a big subject. The problem is this is a trick that's played on Muslims very often. That's a, a standard missionary trick where people will say, look, Muslims, your book says my book is true. So look, my book says your book is false. That kind of nonsense. The Quran talks about other scriptures. It says there's truth in them. And it says there's false in them. And it says the Quran will show you the difference between them. That does not mean that if the Quran says it, but their book says this, the Quran must be right. That's not the attitude. The Quran tells you the truth is obvious, that this is correct can be shown because of what's in their book. In other words, their difficulties can be demonstrated. It's not just a case of saying, my book is true, your book is false. In fact, the one verse that's used, they write missionary books on it, is from the fifth surah, the 48th ayah, where it says of the Quran that it was revealed to confirm the truth in previous books. And this is where people stop. And they say, see, Muslims, your book says my book is true. They stop halfway through the sentence. The rest of the verse says, and it was revealed, and the Arabic word used is Muhammad, it means as quality control over those books. It tells you which parts are true and which parts aren't, or how you can tell the difference between which parts are true and which parts are not. But more important than that is that whatever the shape of their scriptures is today, whether it contains true or false, very often that is not under discussion when the Quran is talking about their scriptures. It tells them, look in your book and you will find this. Whether your book is true or false, leave that aside for now. In your book it says, so it points out to people their own difficulties. This follows in apparently the best tradition of Jesus. In the fifth chapter of John, he criticized the Jews. He said, you people read the scriptures all the time because you think in there is the secret of life. He didn't say, and you're right. He didn't say that. He said, but I'm telling you, if you were more careful about what you're reading, you would notice that those scriptures tell you about me. You should be listening to me. Now, that's basically what the Quran has said of other scriptures. Leaving aside, is it true or is it false? It says, tell them, look in their scripture and they will find the last messenger is mentioned. The last revelation is mentioned. Whether it's true or false is their problem. But they do have this problem that they can't escape. It's one of the, the challenges made. There's one non-Muslim has uh, reacted very well to that. He says, uh, we have the ayah, uh, that says that the messenger is mentioned by name in their scriptures and it was speaking to Jews and Christians and he points out how there were lots of Jews and Christians around that heard that when that revelation was given and they had a perfect chance to prove the Quran was wrong they could have jumped up right then and said okay come with me to my house I have no way to get a there ahead of you come with me to my house you're welcome to look in all my books you won't find anything about your messenger Nobody did that. Nobody invited the Muslim to say, ah, this time your book made a mistake. See, there's nothing in our books about the messenger. Come and see. Nobody did that. They didn't want to talk about it. That's why, in fact, one non-Muslim scholar has suggested that the Christians and Jews at that time, in that place, must have had something very obvious in what they called scripture that mentioned the messenger. That's why they kept silent at that point. We get from that. Yes. Yeah. alaikum. I will, um, I've read in the Quran that there are um, beautiful women in heaven, as as a reward to men, and um, and and non non-believers have said that this is um, sexist and also animal animal sort of animal instinct. So they sh they say it shouldn't it shouldn't be included in the Quran. Yeah. And um, maybe you can expand on this because you know much more than I do anyway. That is um, sexist. They seem to be saying, oh, men have a great reward because there are women. They should look more carefully that, in fact, 
that is the usual uh, understanding. But if you look at all verses related to that, it talks about companions provided for people. It does not specifically put all the believers in paradise are men who have beautiful women. It talks about companions suitably uh, chosen for uh, all the believers. This is their reward. So that's usually the picture that people draw without realizing it's a much more general explanation of that in the first place. Uh, beyond that, the reason that that looks animalistic to people reflects a basic difference between Islam and many other uh, religious outlooks. That most religions tell you the world is evil. It's out to trap you and, and so on. It's a bad place. You have to escape the world. Islam doesn't say that. It tells you the world, God made it. It's good. There's some bad things in it, things that will hurt you. He made that too. But the world itself is not evil. So that the Muslim's attitude is different. What he knows and recognizes as a good thing here is something like what will be a good thing there. You give maybe a clearer example. The Quran says, in paradise, you can eat a piece of fruit. And it says, when you eat it, you'll say, this reminds me of what I used to eat. See, only it's obviously so much better. So what you are familiar with now is something like what you get then. Whether it is fruit or companionship or sitting under a shade tree with your feet in a stream, you know something about what that's like. That's what paradise is like. And that's a, uh, I guess that's a basic difference in outlook between Muslims and others. That primarily, most religious systems encourage the idea that your means and your ends are different. What you want can be different than how you get it. That the end justifies the means. They tell you, you want justice? Well, you have to treat some people unfairly for a while, then you get justice. And the Muslim says, no, no. <laughs> you want justice, you practice justice. You want truth, you tell the truth. You don't tell a few lies until the truth comes, then you tell the truth. That the goal and the method are the same kind of thing. So if you want to establish the truth, uh, you speak the truth, and you will get a reward like that. One of the rewards of paradise is it says you won't hear any funny talking nonsense in that place. If that's what you want, a reward to be in a place where nobody talks silly, then you have to now put a stop to silly talk. See? Same thing. So that, that's why in the surah, the Asr, one of the four things, the difference between those who are lost and those who have success, says, Tawasu bil haq. says they confront one another with the truth. It means that a Muslim could not be sitting and he hears somebody talking here and it's foolishness. He says, oh, well, it's not my business. He has an obligation to somehow bring to their attention the truth of the matter. In some way, at least to say, I heard what you said, uh, it's not true, but excuse me, if you want to know more, come and see me, or, or something. But you have to say something. Then you get a place like that. What's that? All oh, his companions and that? Well, that's metaphorical only in the same sense as, as the fruit is, you see. That, uh, if the Quran says you eat a piece of fruit and it's telling you when you eat it, you'll say this is something like what I used to eat. Well, it means then it must be different. So it's not exactly fruit like we know fruit. But in a, in a way that is familiar to us, it's something like fruit. That's what I'm saying of companions. You, you might say metaphorically in that it could be companionship and it would remind us of what good companionship is like. But then again, it's something we, we don't imagine. It's so much better than that. So that... Paradise is familiar, but more than you can expect. Okay? <laughs> well, that's a, a thing that I'm afraid is often misunderstood by Muslims. When they say there are verses of the Quran that are abrogated, that tell you this means that... Uh, some verses are uh, overruled by other verses. That is, a verse says this, but another verse tells you that's not true anymore. There's no such pair of verses in the Quran. It's impossible. 
The Quran says it doesn't have any contradictions, so how could there be one verse that tells you something different than another verse? When the ayah says, if it came from other than Allah, surely they would find in it, ikhtilaf and kathir, many inconsistencies. Is the arna. There's no inconsistency. Where the misunderstanding often comes is, for example, someone will say, and someone told me, I said, can you show me an abrogated verse? This is this one. It says, don't pray if you've been drinking. But this ayah says, don't drink. But those are not two different things. This one is not different than that one. To say, don't pray when you've been drinking, is not erased by a verse which says, don't drink. Those don't say different things. It's, uh, it's a thing that the, the law is well familiar with, uh, that you have... In effect, all you need is one law, if that's the case. The law says behave. And that eliminates all the other laws. <laughs> but it doesn't. And it's in that same spirit that you may find uh, this misunderstanding among people. They say, uh, another example is people will say, the Quran says, don't take a second wife unless you can treat them equally. But they say, in this verse, it says you can take four. So that's a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. The one is a qualification, the other is a limitation. It's called a contradistinction, or what is contrapuntal, but it's not in conflict. Saying don't have more than one if you can't treat them equally is not the opposite of saying don't take more than four. Exactly, that's what I'm telling you is that there's no such thing as an abrogated verse. If by abrogation you mean this verse tells you this one isn't true anymore, there's no such verse like that. There are verses which swallow up other verses, but they don't contradict them. So it comes under that uh, test in the sense that if somebody wants to find a contradiction in the Quran, he's welcome to even examine the so-called abrogated verses, and he won't find contradiction. Okay, I hope that satisfies what I'm getting at. There's also the point that where that, that argument is often used by uh, missionaries where they will say uh, uh, the Quran abrogates other verses so it must contain contradictions. Uh, well, they, they don't seem to realize that any verse that anybody has ever talked about involving abrogation was related to legal matters. And yet the ayah in the Quran that talks about abrogation is a Meccan ayah whereas the laws didn't come till Medina. So what's being talked about, that some ayah is replaced by another ayah, can't mean the ayat of the Quran, it has to mean previous ayah. It has to mean other things that people had before the Quran. Let's see. Uh, a medical student once posed this question, how can we say the Quran is authentic? Uh, to prove it, should you refer to hadith? Well, I don't know what help that would be, um, to refer to hadith, if you mean the Quran is true because I have a hadith that says so, that <laughs> won't prove anything to anybody. But the authenticity of the Quran was the thing that I was trying to talk about, that you have to eliminate the possibilities. If somebody says, your book is not a revelation, then you have to ask him, tell me, what is it? What is it then? If he says, it's a lie, he says, show me a lie. Where did it tell a lie? If he says, uh, your prophet was uh, a lunatic, say, show me a crazy thing. If he tells you he was a liar, uh, you know, show me the lie. If he was a lunatic, how do you explain his information? If he was a liar, how do you explain his attitude? So you have to give it back to someone to say, if you claim it is this, you have to prove it's that. I can show you why it can't be that. So you establish it by eliminating the alternatives. Question from a uh, non-Muslim. So the Quran has proved itself with the past. What has it got to say about the, the future? Uh, oh, yes, a great deal. Uh, uh, that's a favorite subject. Uh, if you want to talk about hadith, you have a, a narration that says that the wonders of this book never cease, meaning that in every generation there are new surprises. History may continue for uh, 10,000 years, and there will still be Muslims saying, I never noticed that before. That's amazing. Something new in every generation. Um, what it has to say about today, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, I, I mentioned one there concerning the origin of the, the universe. Um, 
it also mentions certain things that people expect to find. It tells you, for example, in an ayah, which has a very interesting construction, it tell, tells you about the dabba. And the dabba is any kind of an animal that crawls. It tells you dabba live in the heavens and on earth. Which is telling you someday somebody evidently is going to find a dabba somewhere else. Some crawling, living thing, someplace else. Because it mentions the dabba is in the, uh, the heavens, the earth, and the places in between them. So as far as you see and where you are and all the places in between there, there's dabba. No one's found one yet, but see, that's the thing that when it is found, the Muslim can say, I knew it. <laughs> it must be true. The Quran says so. That's an example of that kind of thing. Uh, it mentions what some are now, in fact, it was just in the newspaper that I was looking at. Let's see, the brother's got on his knee there now. Uh, when it's talking about Halley's Comet, is due to appear in uh, January, March, or February, March, 86. Uh, it tells you where, does, where do all these comets come from. And it talks about a thing called the Oort Cloud, which is like, a, you might say, a shell around the solar system containing these balls of ice and rock. And this is where the comets seem to originate. Uh, so the theory goes. And they named the place after this astronomer named Oort. But that seems to be what the Quran is talking about when it talks about a, um, a wall, a division, a barrier, a line, a boundary at some certain distance as you leave the earth remains open to discussion. But that's, that's the kind of thing that the early Muslim uh, astronomers, uh, mathematicians, biologists, medical men, chemists, and so on, that's the kind of thing that guided them. They'd see some little thing in the Quran and say, that looks interesting. What will I find if I look? And they found a lot of surprising things. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got still more here. You referred to the Messiah being killed by Jews. Uh, isn't it true the Messiah was substituted and will return? Uh, I didn't say the Messiah was killed by the Jews. I said that's what the Jews said. Uh, <laughs> And that, in fact, is what the, is the point that is made in the Quran. It says the Jews said, we killed the Messiah. And then it goes on to say they were mistaken. They didn't kill him. They thought they did. That's what it looked like. It does not specifically say in the Quran that somebody was substituted. It simply says it, the whole episode, this crucifixion, was counterfeited. It's probably the best translation. It's a form of the word um, um, sabha. Yes, it is. Wait, no. Was the word you have the two kinds of verses? The, what are the two kinds of verses in the Quran? The Mukhamat and the Mutashabihat. Yeah, Shabha. Shabha. It was made doubtful. So it may mean they killed the wrong man. It may mean they killed nobody. But what we know is they didn't kill the Messiah. That's what the Quran has to say. Uh, what is the surah which inspired you most? Um, how you embrace Islam? Um, well, there's, yeah, there's various things that are impressive. I guess uh, one of the first things that occurred to me was that I mentioned this ayah that challenges you to find mistakes in the Quran. There's the surah al-Hadid begins by saying, "Who will?" Well, in the third ayah, is, "Who will awal wal akhir wal zahir wal batin," which tells you that no matter where you start, there's something you can't escape. <laughs> something there is which is first, last, outermost, and innermost. And look in that place. That's where you find God. Um, and of course, the Surah Al-Ikhlas. That's one of the... There's, uh, in just these few words, there's a, a wealth of material there. Somebody asked the Prophet one time, where did God come from? And he didn't say, as most Muslims say today, oh, this is a Satan's question. Mm -hmm very good question. He quoted that surah. It gives at least four answers to that question. Each ayah gives you an answer. It would take a lot of discussion to go into it, but each verse of that tells you what's wrong with your question or what is the answer to it. Uh, that was impressive to me. Does the Quran mention anything about purda? purda? Well, uh, it's not exactly on the topic, but uh, the word 
Hood, uh, of course, is not in the Koran. I imagine everybody knows that. But it talks uh, quite a bit about uh, suitable uh, adornment for both men and women, what is required. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, too. That, too, is a subject in itself, which uh, sometimes I get into quite the discussions with people on that. You have an interesting example. For instance, I wonder how many people realize that what it tells a woman to conceal are literally her pockets, pockets in her body, pockets. You see, that can tell you a lot about what is required which people don't often think about. They may just think, oh, cover the woman. No, but it says, cover your pockets. <laughs> because it specifically mentions there's some things you can't help. That's the way a woman is. But the pockets cover them. I don't mean pockets like where you keep your money. But, but, but you see, so there's, there's a wealth of material there if a person would just even examine the Arabic. You find a great deal of explanation in just a very few words on that subject, which is... And so, well, widely misunderstood, uh, I'm afraid. I always hate to see somebody forcing something on somebody which is not uh, required. But that, too, is a big subject. Yes. Bismillah. I ask your permission also for the question, which has particularly bothered me because the description of the lecture in itself... Of the which? Of the lecture in itself, the amazing Quran. Yes. When we speak of Allah, we never arrogate unto ourselves. We never have which? We never arrogate unto ourselves yes. the right for an adjective description. The Quran is the revelation of Allah. Unlike the Prophet Rasulullah, who the Quran says is a man and a messenger. Forgive me for asking the question if you think it is something that is beyond the realms of the lecture in itself. But may I ask you that do you think any insan who is created in this world has the right to arrogate unto himself the beauty of the Quran with just any adjective that can describe the Qur'an in the form of either amazing, loving, beautiful, hoary, or anything of the sort. Okay. Well, uh, so the, the Qur'an itself uses adjectives that describe itself, and that's what uh, I was trying to say, that, for example, in the, the, the one ayah, it mentions about the revelation that it made the Prophet, it says, Ajibta, which means it surprises it surprised him. The revelation surprised him. So if I say of the Quran that it is surprising or amazing, I'm saying what it says of itself. That's what it says it's like. That's not adding something. The word holy is uh, really, that's a troublesome word in English, and I, would, I don't use it to talk about the Quran because it's inappropriate in English, technically. The word holy comes from the same root as you spell with the W in front of it, W-H-O-L-E, whole. So that people are not holy, there's only one who's holy, it's Allah, he's one. That was the original understanding even in English of the word holy. You only apply that, you said God is holy because he's one whole thing. Nobody else is one like that. But it's fallen into such careless use that people talk about holy men and holy this and holy that. And that's unfortunate. Uh, even uh, the, the Arabic word uh, what, kadus is sometimes translate holy that's not really the best English word for that because that gives a misunderstanding uh, of, of this only Allah is holy the Quran may be kareem uh, what other words uh, they say mad, uh, majid and, and some other descriptions like this but not holy in the proper meaning of that word it doesn't talk about itself that way Okay. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, technically, the, 
uh, suggest the Muslim has a, a different approach just to give a comparison for, for what we're familiar with, with Christianity. The Christian says, God revealed himself to us. The Muslim says, no, God can't reveal himself. Man uh, can't absorb this. But he revealed his will. He revealed what he wants you to know. So that's, I, I think, what you're talking about. <laughs> that the, the speech of Allah is what he wants you to know. It's not Allah. So you, you, you couldn't describe it that way. Um, that's what, usually when the Muslim and the Christian use that word revelation, they're talking about different things. If, uh, it's happened to me many times. Somebody say, what does God reveal to you? I say, he told me what he wanted me to know. They say, no, no, no. What did he reveal? Okay. Well, now he's talking about something else. He means something he can't explain. He means how did he, I don't know, light a fire under you or, or, or something. Because that's what they mean by revelation. And that's not really the concept in the Quran. A tanzil is information, something given to you. But that's a, a maybe, I don't know if you want to go into an argument that was old a thousand years ago. <laughs> People argued about, was the Quran created or uncreated? And, you know, argued that for a long time. Is there anybody else? Because I don't know what our time limit is. Okay. Some of the questions that cannot be answered that are on these uh, lists are absolutely outside the lecture today and yet some of them require a lecture itself. There are some questions like, you know, what is the difference between Sunni and Shia? They were completely outside the lecture and I, I would please, if any of you want to ask a question, please do so on the subject that was discussed today. Any questions now? On the subject that we discussed today, it should be relevant, should not be outside the topic that was discussed. <laughs> yeah, what was it? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. What about the Hadith Qudsi? Correct? Yeah, but uh, you will agree with me. I can. You can just go. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, I think. Um, I missed that, I'm afraid. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, here's the, the question. Um, the Quran says many times that it is complete. You find that in the sixth surah, for example, about the 112th, 113th ayah, it says there's nothing left out, no detail. So, in fact, I remember talking with an Egyptian brother one time, and I mentioned this ayah, and he said, that's not true. You need this, you need that. I said, no, what does it say here? You can read Arabic. He reads. There's nothing is left out of this book. He says, but that's not true. You see, I said, you're not arguing with me now. You're arguing with what the ayah says. Nothing left out. Now, the misunderstanding that often comes from that, though, is that, is that Muslims could fall into the same trap that some religious groups fall into. That is, they believe in their book and they become so wrapped up in this book they don't know anything else. The Quran is not of that nature. The Quran tells you what you need is here. It lacks nothing. But what does it tell you to do? Time and time again it says, look here, look there. If you don't think this is true, look there, you'll see it is. Verify this, examine that, research this, find out more about that. So it keeps directing your attention to 